Good morning, um, and welcome to the Alumni Weekend and to the critical choices on the desk of the Oval Office. Um, thank you very much for joining us this morning. My name is Mary Perry. I've learned that I am a triple terrier graduate of the, graduate of the college and the graduate schools of arts and sciences, as well as the law school. Uh, it is a thrill to be back at BU for me, and I'm hoping that you are all feeling the same way as I am. The council is pleased to have you on campus this weekend, and I want to tell you a little bit about what the Alumni Council is. It is a leadership group for the Alumni Association. Uh, we draw upon the expertise and the dedication of the talented alumni from all of BU's colleges and schools. Our council members serve as an important voice to university leadership and to work actively to engage alumni in meaningful ways with BU and with one another. This morning's session features faculty members from the Political Science Department within the College of Arts and Sciences. I am pleased to introduce you to Graham Wilson, Doug Kreiner, uh, Catherine Einstein, and Nita Crawford. Um, they will lead the conversation on the election year and most importantly on the issues that will be on the desk of the Oval Office come next January. I hand the program over to Professor Wilson now, Chair of the Political Science Department and the panelists. Well, first let me add my warm welcome back to all of you. It's great that you've taken the time this weekend to come back to visit Boston University and thank you in particular for coming to this session. This is a time of great excitement and dynamism in the Political Science Department. We've been recruiting fabulous people over the last 10 years or so, and we've got a group of uh, all of them, uh, not all of them, we've got a group of them here today. Uh, could I just ask, are there any alumni from our political science major present today? Um, I hope you're getting the newsletter. If you're not getting the newsletter, it probably means that we don't have an accurate email address for you. And in that case, uh, could you let uh, Kate, Caitlin Lee from the uh, Alumni Association get, uh, have a correct email address before you leave? Um, we ha have made a number of changes in the department in recent years, one of which is to uh, create a program for students to earn honors in the major. And this is a very exciting honors program where we, on the one hand, have the students write a thesis about uh, a research topic in political science. But on the other hand, we also tell them to get some real world political experience on a campaign of their choice or an internship or something like that. And uh, we think this is an exciting combination for an honors program. And I'm delighted to say that we have received the financial support of one of our alumni, uh, Mr. David Weinstein, to support the research that students will be carrying out in that program. And this gives me a chance to thank all of you for your donations to the annual fund. And if I may say so, a particular thank you for the donations to the annual fund that come to the political science department. Well, turning to today's program, as we began to plan this program, obviously some months ago, I thought to myself, well, maybe by this point, people have seen so many opinion polls about who's ahead and who's behind that we shouldn't just focus on who's going to win and why. But let me add immediately that we are really, really happy to talk about who's ahead, who's behind, and why, if that's the direction the conversation goes in. However, we also thought that maybe this is a moment to reflect on some of the critical choices that whoever is president in January next year will have to make. Once the shouting is over, once the returns are in, once it's all settled, what are the fundamental choices that this country needs to face up to or can't avoid facing up to, depending on your point of view? And so the panel I've put together to address this includes some of the ex very exciting people who've joined the department in the last 10 years. Uh, on my left, Doug Kreiner, who uh, got tenure this year to great acclamation. A lot of people said he earned tenure three times over through great contributions, great contributions in teaching, research, and in services to our students. On his immediate left, we have um, Catherine Einstein, who is our newest recruit. And she comes to us after a glittering academic career as an undergraduate and a graduate student at Harvard University. And then on her left, 
Professor Nita Crawford, who heads up the International Relations Group in the department. And uh, she is somebody who uh, brings great distinction to our department, uh, serving on the Council of the American Political Science Association and many other national and international bodies. So uh, we're going to start with Doug Kreiner, and then we'll have a contribution from Katie, uh, myself, and then finally Nita. So over to you, Doug. All right, well, thank you, and I'll just join uh, Graham's thank yous to all of you for uh, being here today and sharing the, uh, the morning with us. So I'd like to begin by somewhat breaking uh, the injunction about not speaking too much about the election, and then I'll move on uh, to looking at a couple of specific policy choices, mainly regarding tax and budgetary policy uh, and foreign policy, which I'm sure Professor Crawford will have more insight into in just a bit. Regarding the election, rather than looking at you know, horse race polls of who's ahead and who's behind, I just wanted to pose a question. You know, is this election 1984 or is it 1992? In the former, uh, or I would say in 1992, a bad economy triggered the defeat of a president uh, who had ha enjoyed considerable successes in foreign policy, indeed becoming the most popular president in the history of Gallup opinion polling. Uh, in the former, in 1984, by contrast, uh, a high unemployment rate did not end up crippling the re-election chances of the incumbent administration. Indeed, President Reagan uh, secured a landslide victory over Walter Mondale. Uh, so the paradox here is two re relatively bad economies, one incumbent that gets re-elected in sweeping fashion, uh, in the other, an incumbent that goes down to defeat, presents us with a little bit of a puzzle. Uh, and I thought that this is one puzzle that political scientists uh, really offer some insight into. When scholars of voting behavior try and understand how the economy affects uh, voting decisions, they often ask questions, are American voters primarily retrospective uh, or are they prospective? Or put slightly differently, are they peasants in their outlook or are they bankers? You know, how is it that they are evaluating uh, the economic stewardship of the incumbent? What is it that they care most about? Uh, and depending on whether uh, voters are retrospective or prospective, you might expect them, even in a bad economy, to behave quite differently. So what about 2012? Retrospective voting, right? This is what Mitt Romney has been encouraging Americans to engage in. Are you better off than you were four years ago? Uh, to the extent that this uh, forced Democrats to also ask that question and to answer it in a very different way. So if Americans are retrospective, what might we expect them to, uh, to do? So in the last poll that I could find that actually asked Americans uh, whether or not they think they're better off today than they were four years ago, the answers were I thought were a little bit surprising. 37% agreed with President Clinton. They are better off. Only 42% seem to agree with Governor Romney that they're unequivocally worse off, and 19% said that they're the same. So it's not clear that sort of, in, to me, that invoking the Ronald Reagan question in 1980 about the Carter administration, are you better off than you were four years ago, that that necessarily uh, is a huge net advantage to the Republican ticket. On the prospective side of the ledger, I think the results are even more clear. There are a lot of different polls that try and ask people about their opinions on the health of the economy over the next uh, 12 months to, to 24 months, about their expectations for their personal economic fortunes. So I could be guilty of cherry picking a bit here, but I've tried not to. Uh, one question, for instance. In the next 12 months, do you think your personal economic fortunes are going to get better? Are they going to get worse? Are they going to stay the same? 32% of Americans said better. Only 12% took the very pessimistic attitude, thinking that they were going to get worse. And 51% said that they would stay the same. And another one, thinking about the country's economic fortunes over the, over the coming year. Are you hopeful, pessimistic, uh, neither hopeful nor pessimistic? 58% said they had a hopeful outlook on how the economy was going to progress. So on both of these metrics, uh, despite the fact of record high unemployment, low levels of job growth, uh, and an overall global slowdown, it's not clear that even in terms of the fundamentals uh, that it should be quite the slam dunk for Governor Romney that some present it to be, which makes us really question, 
how much do these alleged campaign gaffes really have much influence on the race? Or is the relatively narrow uh, race between the two fairly neck and neck, uh, although uh, Obama sort of maybe uh, <laughs> excuse me, uh, inching ahead in some of the, the key swing states, is that not what we would expect just by an objective look uh, at the fundamentals of where things are today? On the budget, very quickly then, sorry, I went a little longer than I hoped. We often hear about gridlock in DC and partisan polarization and how that leads to absolutely nothing getting done. But we've got two issues that are going to be on President Obama's de desk come November or December, regardless of whether or not he wins or loses. And then depending upon how those are dealt with, uh, they might be on uh, President Romney's desk if he were elected shortly thereafter. And that is we've got two issues facing the country uh, in which the standard modus operandi in Washington is sort of flipped on its head. Uh, and these are the extension of the Bush tax cuts or their expiration in January, as well as the automatic sequestration of a large amount of federal spending as a result of the failed budget compromises of 2011. Uh, so why do I say this turns Washington politics on its head? Most of the time, 95% of the issues in Washington, if Congress doesn't do something, policy remains the same. On these two issues, if Congress doesn't do something, policy changes dramatically. Uh, and in that, I think, because of that, uh, we really set the stage for some of this polarization, some of this gridlock to be broken. Uh, I think that both of these cases sort of strengthen President Obama's hands uh, in dealing with a Republican Congress in that if they can't reach some sort of deal, you end up with outcomes that are very, very uh, opposed by most of the congressional Republican leaders, such as the complete uh, um, expiration of the Bush tax cuts, not even their partial extension, uh, and the sequestration of a large amount of spending, including on the defense side of the ledger. Uh, alternatively, if it is uh, President Romney come January dealing with these issues with some temporary extension, uh, he's got to deal with the threat of a, of a Democratic filibuster or a majority even perhaps uh, in the Senate. And this is going to put pressure on them to reach some sort of compromise as well. So on both of these fronts, I think uh, the budgetary politics with this very peculiar feature of dramatic shifts in policy, if no compromise is reached, might actually lead to more compromise than we would have expected based on uh, recent politics. And finally, I thought I'd say just a few words about Afghanistan uh, and let Professor Crawford perhaps uh, pick up on it more. So Afghanistan is an issue that we don't hear much about uh, in the campaigns. Uh, Governor Romney doesn't talk about it much, probably because his position that we shouldn't even be thinking about withdrawal is so anathemic to the vast majority of Americans. And even President Obama doesn't talk about it too much, preferring instead to talk about uh, the raid on Osama bin Laden's compound, because here too you have an incumbent president who seems to be on the wrong side of public opinion. Um, <clears throat> the vast majority of Americans say that continuing to fight this war is not worth its cost, and roughly 50% favor withdrawal ahead of schedule of the 2014 deadline that's been set by President Obama. There are big decisions. Uh, do we continue withdrawal at its current pace? Do we accelerate it? Do we push it back because the gains in security that were expected have not been made? Uh, and even if we do withdraw all of the combat troops, how long are we going to remain, retain a residual presence there? How large is that presence going to be? How much is it going to cost at a time when we're talking about significant cuts, uh, both in the domestic budget, but more relevantly in the Pentagon budget? Are you going to really be slashing the DOD's funds and then asking them to continue uh, a costly foreign deployment that limits their flexibility in dealing with other challenges around the globe, whether it be in Iran, Libya, Syria, or North Korea? And so those are going to be big issues that are going to be thrust onto the desk of the new commander in chief, uh, regardless of whether or not that person happens to be a Democrat or a Republican. Thank you, Kate. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm going to be talking with you about um, three major domestic policy challenges that we'll be facing the next president. The first is youth unemployment, particularly among individuals who have only a high school diploma. The second issue will be the struggling state budgets. And the third will be immigration, particularly whether the federal government will provide benefits to individuals already living in this country. So first, youth unemployment. 
the unemployment rate for workers under the age of 25 remains roughly twice as high as the national average right now. So for young college graduates, the unemployment rate was 9.4% over the last year. The underemployment rate, which is the rate for those looking for more work hours but unable to find them, was 19%. The situation is even more dire for people who have only a high school diploma. So the unemployment rate for those individuals is 30%, and the underemployment rate is 54%. These periods of unemployment in young workers are devastating. Economics research shows that early bouts with unemployment and underemployment can have a permanent impact on long-term career prospects and lifetime earnings. They also prevent young people from taking major life steps, like buying a house or paying off debts. Between 2007 and 2009, 24% of 20 to 34-year-olds lived with their parents at some point, and that's compared to only 17% in 1980. Moreover, these young people are burdened with debts in an unprecedented way. So roughly two-thirds of bachelor's degrees recipients borrow money to attend college. Unable to pay off these loans, many young graduates are delaying making big purchases, like buying a house or buying a car. A survey of recent college graduates has found that 40% say that they have delayed buying a house and buying a car because they have such high college debts. One quarter had also put off continuing their education or moved in with their parents. There are a number of possible policy solutions that the next president could engage in, including additional stimulus spending, job training programs, continuing credits for first-time home buyers, and student loan forgiveness. The next president will need to weigh these different policy alternatives and find ways of bringing these young people back into the labor force and alleviating their financial difficulties. So the second big issue I wanted to talk about were state budget crises. Um, so 31 of the nation's 50 states right now are facing budget shortfalls that total $55 billion for the coming fiscal year. These are huge deficits. They're a little smaller than in previous years, but they are enormous by historical standards and a huge economic problem. So these um, budget gaps have been largely spurred by weak tax collections. The Great Recession of 2007 drove the largest collapse in state revenues on record. While many of these states were initially buoyed by federal stimulus spending, they are now receiving very little federal aid. Moreover, their obligations are actually growing with the recession. So states expect to educate 540,000 more K-12 and 2.5 million more public college and university students in the upcoming school year than at the beginning of the recession. In addition, 4.8 million people have, are projected to be eligible for subsidized health insurance through Medicaid as compared with 2008. And this is because of job losses, lost earnings, and um, the increased cost of health care for employers. Many of them have decided to stop covering. So this means that many American states are facing tough budget cuts, threatening thousands of public and private sector jobs. State budget crises are a drag on the national reco um, economic recovery, and they're threatening the job creation that we should be expecting at this point in the recovery. So the next president is going to have to find a way to address these issues. He is going to have to provide some form of federal support to struggling state governments if he hopes to push along the national economic recovery. Without public sector employment and private sector contracting jobs, Fundamentally, it will be very difficult to have a full recovery. And more fundamentally, the next president is going to need to take on a difficult task of evaluating which policies should continue to be funded at the state level and which would be better dispersed at the federal level. So finally, I'm going to conclude my remarks by talking a little bit about immigration policy and where we are on that and what the next president will need to address. So one of the central challenges that is going to be facing the next president is how the federal government plans to treat immigrants, particularly undocumented immigrants. Um, perhaps most importantly, the next administration is going to need to reconcile a patchwork of seemingly conflicting federal government policies. For example, 
The Obama administration administered a landmark policy in June that offered um, hundreds of thousands of undocumented immigrants who came to this country as children, one, the ability to remain in the country without fear of deportation, and two, the ability to work in this country. This policy meant that for 800,000 young people, they can now work legally and they can get documents like driver's licenses that are necessary to participate in this country. This policy did not, however, grant any permanent legal status to these young undocumented workers. Moreover, the White House actually just ruled this week, many of you may have seen this, that Obama's health care coverage under his new um, health care plan will not cover these young undocumented workers who are allowed to stay in this country. Um, and the DREAM Act, which would have provided permanent residency to many of these young workers, has languished in Congress for years. This has prevented many of these young undocumented workers from going to college and assimilating into the country that they now live in. All of this discussion of young undocumented workers also ignores most of the 11 million unauthorized immigrants that are living in this country. So the next president is going to have to address some challenging issues regarding amnesty, work permits, and permanent residency. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, I think in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, it says that the meaning of life is 41. Uh, and I hope I've got that figure right. 42, as it was, well, somewhere in the 40s. Uh, the figure I'm going to ask you to remember is in the 30s, uh, 37. And I'll come back to that figure in just a moment. But first, I just wanted to tell you that a lot of my writing and research has been focused on the question of, is the United States fundamentally different from the other advanced democracies in terms of what people expect from government, demand from government in terms of its role in their lives. And if you look at the abstract question, go to the opinion polls and say, for example, which do you prefer, a smaller government that does less with lower taxation, a bigger government that does more with higher taxation? Americans look different. Overwhelmingly, by about a two to one margin, they say, smaller government, that's what we believe in. And of course, many people have rolled this sort of uh, response into the idea of American exceptionalism, not meaning that America is necessarily better or necessarily worse than any other advanced democracy, but it's just different in expecting less from government. However, when you turn to the reality of government programs, do you want the government to continue to play this role? Do you want it to do more? Overwhelmingly, with one interesting exception, which we perhaps can come back to, Americans have continued and have consistently had high, relatively high expectations of government. And this contrast between what people say in the abstract about the role of government and what they expect on a day-to-day -day basis is intriguing. It's perhaps personified by that famous placard that somebody carried in a protest against the um, Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, whichever uh, label you prefer, keep your government off my Medicare. Now, okay, back to that figure of 37. What does that figure represent? That is, to me, the astonishing figure that 37 cents of every dollar that the federal government is spending today is borrowed. That we are dependent to an extraordinary degree on borrowing from other people, and indeed, increasingly, it's been over the last few decades from other countries. In the 1950s, we borrowed much less. Nearly all of that money was borrowed inside the United States. In more recent times, approximately half that money is borrowed from overseas, and half of that, which is to say roughly 25% of the total, is borrowed from China, a country that remains, of course, whatever the total size of its economy, a country that is dramatically poorer in terms of per capita living standards. So how did we get in this situation of having that huge amount of borrowing? David Wessel, the Wall Street uh, journalist, has written a very good, easily read book on this topic, and he points to the following. The Bush tax cuts, two major reductions in federal revenue, two wars that were not funded through increases in taxation, some increase in federal responsibilities, particularly the prescription drug benefit, and of course, the impact that Katie's referred to at the state level, also on the national government, of declining tax revenues as the economy tanked. 
But nonetheless, we have this staggering uh, amount of borrowing going on by the federal government. Does that matter? Well, it's hard to say. Obviously, the US Treasury is able to get money for, an, I was going to say for a nickel, but it's actually much less than a nickel these days. Uh, people are almost paying the US Treasury to keep their money. They are getting far less in terms of uh, interest payments than any realistic measure of inflation. Maybe we can continue on this forever, uh, or at least as far as the eye can see. Who really trusts putting their money in the euro at present? Look at the difficulties that the Chinese economy itself seems to be experiencing. The reason, there are good reasons why people are prepared to lend their money to the US government for almost nothing. On the other hand, who knows? And that could change. A lot of people have said that markets change faster than government policies. Doug has pointed to how policy might change relatively rapidly. But nonetheless, markets could change even faster. And that amount of debt that we have accumulating, that amount of borrowing we're doing, is something which is very, very uh, potentially dangerous if the econo economic situation was to change, if interest rates internationally suddenly started to rise rapidly. Well, how do we get out of this? What's the cause of this situation? We have seen federal spending rising very rapidly in some areas. A lot of those areas are quite popular. Before the Obama health legislation was passed, we were already at the point where 51% of, of total expenditure on health care in this country came from the federal government. We continue to behave as though we have a purely, had a purely private health care system before the Obama Affordable Health Care Act was passed. But the reality is that that 51% of health care expenditure coming from the federal government was not only high, but is growing rapidly. On the other hand, let's look at taxation. The federal tax take, the proportion of family income taken in taxes by the federal government is at almost historically low proportions, at least for, for the modern era by which I mean since roughly 1950. There's been a major decline in the proportion of family income taken in federal taxation over the last 20 years. Now, who wants to really talk about that, all of this? Who wants to talk on the right about defense expenditure? I was given the figure by somebody who I think knows what he's talking about, that there are in effect 13 aircraft carriers in the world that are fully operational today meaning not only are they seaworthy, but they have aircraft on them. They could go to sea, they could go to war. Of those 13 aircraft carriers in the world that are prepared for war, 11 are American. And what that reflects is the fact that our defense expenditure is equal to, and here you get slightly different figures, either the next 15 or the next 17 countries combined. On the other hand, on the left, who wants to really talk about that taxation take? That that, that fall in the proportion of family income taken in federal taxation is not going to be closed simply by increasing taxes for people earning over $250,000 a year. So we face unpopular choices for both the left and the right and on, on expenditure, but we also probably face the reality that any meaningful increase in taxation to close the gap is going to certainly affect the billionaires and millionaires that I think quite reasonably we hear a lot about during the election campaign, but really closing the budget deficit would probably affect everybody in terms of more federal income tax. My take on the situation is that we have been either very wise or very childish. We've been either taking a great deal or uh, that's been offered to us by the political system. Or, on the other hand, we have been led into a childish fantasy. A childish fantasy in which we have basically been told you can uh, have your cake and you can eat it too. You can have government services, you can have the dominant military force in the world that is very popular, but you don't have to pay for it. And that's what that 37 uh, figure represents to me, fundamentally that the net upshot of the political system up to now has been a combination of the public either very wisely 
taking from one group the promise of ever lower taxation and no increase in taxes, and taking from another group the promise of the maintenance of popular domestic, military, and foreign policies. So maybe with the fiscal cliff, we are finally facing the moment of truth. Or maybe, just to be slightly more cynical, Washington will once again find a way of avoiding the real choices, which is perhaps fundamentally what all of us want, so we can continue having either this great bargain or this childish fantasy. Thank you. Nita. I thought this, since you're coming back to BU uh, for uh, a panel, you should get the benefits of somebody behind a podium. And I always talk better this way. I tend to uh, get away from my notes otherwise. And what I wanted to do was, first of all, highlight, during these presentations, I was taking notes on, on all the international issues that came up. And there were so many, I stopped taking notes. Because what, one of the, the takeaways from my presentation to you today is the intimate connection between the domestic and the international. The choices that the United States makes about domestic policy affect its international position and uh, vice versa. If I was uh, an advisor to the president on my first day um, as an advisor, let's say the national, member of the National Security Council, my memo would read uh, with four bullet points. The first one would be, okay, Mr. President, what are the perennial issues that the United States faces that you must face, must address? Uh, they are questions simply of grand strategy. And I say simply, but there's a number of options there. The first option is, does the United States see itself, how does the United States see itself in the world? As world policemen, uh, as Wilsonian, uh, bringers of democracy, idealists tilting at uh, political change far away? Does the United States see itself as hegemonic with military preeminence and control as the American identity? Uh, is isolationism still an option? I would then say to the president, well, okay, if, what, tell me what your vision is. And maybe they would say, I don't know. And then they'd say, uh, then I'd say, well, we also have to think in terms of U.S. interests. What are they? Do we have a global, broad conception of interests or a more narrow conception of interests? And by that I mean, is the United States primarily concerned with uh, pre preparing to defend itself from attack? That is the narrow vision of what a military is to do. Or is it that the United States would like to use its military forces abroad to control? Then I'd ask, what are the threats to those interests? What are the threats to the identity of the United States and its understanding of interest? If interests are narrowly defined, then uh, the threats to the territorial integrity of the United States are still rather numerous. They include climate change with an average of 36 inches of sea level rise predicted in the next 100 years, 18 to 36 inches depending on where you live. Uh, energy and other resource scarcity questions. And then uh, thirdly, border security from long range military and short range terrorist threats. If interests are broadly defined, then the threats to the US include all of the above, uh, plus challenges to the hegemonic military position of the United States and its economic position, as well as any potential affronts to US values, uh, human rights, free markets, and democracy. Then I'd say to the president, well, what's your disposition? Is it uh, unilateral, multilateral, negotiation, or confrontation? So every president asks and answers those questions before they get to the Oval Office or sometime during their tenure. Uh, and and uh, I would say that the clearest answers we haven't had in, in 20 years, the last two presidents have um, had less well-formed understandings of U.S. grand strategy, uh, I'm including the current president, uh, and its uh, identity than previous presidents. And so I think we enter a period where things are actually a little more fluid than, than often is the case for the next four years. 
Now I want to talk about security policy, something I know more about than many other things. And uh, I would here highlight the problem of uh, military spending that's already been mentioned. In the short term, uh, war-related spending is still relatively high. In the long term, the war-related spending will hang over this economy for the next 30 years, in, it, but it's not directly related to the military budget. It is the spending on veterans, which will be about a trillion dollars over the next 30 to 40 years, and uh, also on uh, other replacement that is military, they call it reset, replacing the weapons and so on that were uh, used in these wars. So uh, in the long run, we'll see a hangover once the troops leave uh, military related spending, military cause spending. These are obligations the United States cannot back out of its commitment to veterans. Um, then in terms of uh, the uh, uh, base budget, which is that part of the budget that is not related to war, the base military spending, that, has, that figure has basically doubled uh, over the last decade. When Secretary of Defense, the last Republican Secretary of Defense, Robert Gates, talked about this, he said the culture of endless money that has taken hold must be replaced by a culture of restraint. The culture of endless money must be replaced. Well, that's very difficult because there are two factors. The president will face long procurement timelines. For example, the new F-35, should it ever be built, the multi-purpose fighter, uh, many years behind schedule, underperforming and over budget, will be around. A decision needs to be taken about, uh, about this weapon. The United States was expected to buy over 2,000 of them. They keep going up and down about the numbers of this this plane, while it's not working so well, uh, they may reduce uh, further the commitment to buy it, but it's, it, it's a long procurement timeline, and so are all the other weapons in the pipeline. Uh, then there's the procurement of other weapons, which doesn't seem so sensible at all. For instance, the, the cluster munitions, which they've changed uh, the criteria for performance of the cluster munitions, but they'll be phased out in 2018. So the U.S. is buying new munitions to fit the new requirement, yet they should all be phased out by 2018. Seems odd. Uh, a bold president, bold president, not bald, a bold <laughs> president might say, let's not buy that. Let's think about phasing out cluster munitions. In fact, isn't there a cluster munitions treaty that says we shouldn't have any? Uh, then there's the institutionalization of features of U.S. foreign policy that any president needs to deal with. You notice probably that President Obama really didn't change the, the global war on terror. It's pretty much running along the lines that were set in place uh, by Rumsfeld, Cheney, and Bush. Well, that's no surprise. Institutions tend to uh, have policies which are institutionalized and run no matter who's in office. What we see here is that in fact, they've escalated certain elements of the uh, global war on terror. The drone strikes in Yemen, for example, increasing drone strikes in Pakistan, increased militarization of Pakistan has continued. The U.S. is heavily invested in two wars right now, the war in Pakistan, I'm giving you the Pakistan forum that you didn't get to, and the war in Yemen. The war in Yemen has escalated uh, really quite dramatically in the last 11 months or so. Uh, so that's on our table, this policy. Should we reconsider the global war on terror? Not just its packaging, its labeling, but its, its practice. Uh, then another bit of institutionalization that will be on the table clearly is the remnants of the Cold War, which we still have. For example, the nuclear arsenal of over 1,700 strategic nuclear weapons and approximately 5,000 other uh, total nuclear weapons uh, exists. These weapons need to be maintained. There's a continuing investment in them. They're not a huge portion of the military budget, but they're a huge portion of the United States' presence in the world, provocative to many. Uh, then we also have another institutionalized legacy, the bases in Europe. What should happen to those? Uh, the Libertarian Party wants us to get rid of them all. Uh, of course, that's not on the table, but what is a, a better, wiser course? And then finally, I want to turn to uh, the role of Congress. 
Why does this come up when we think about international relations? Well, clearly, the uh, structural role of the Congress uh, is to declare war and think about spending. Crucial. It's also oversight. This Congress and the previous several have been so quiescent as to not be functioning in terms of its role. This needs to change, I argue. Uh, the question that the Congress needs to face is, will we conduct serious hearings about questions? How will we get information out from any government? Obama was very clear that he would open the doors uh, of, se of secrecy, but he hasn't. And we can't expect uh, uh, the next president to be more open either. So how will the Congress get the information for which, uh, for, uh, about which they need to make decisions, uh, to play a meaningful, non-acquiescent role. Uh, they haven't, for example, been able to get from this administration the strategic plans for nuclear war, which they've been asking for, which are supposedly being revised. They haven't pushed on questions of targeted killing in Pakistan or Yemen. Yet this is a change in US policy. It's, it's arguably illegal for the United States to conduct targeted killings in Pakistan and Yemen. Congress has not taken this up. Uh, and then uh, we want to think clearly through the other ways that were mentioned, I won't go through them all, um, about uh, the, the links between domestic and foreign policy. For, for instance, agricultural subsidies on corn and sugar, which do affect the uh, price of food all over the world. Um, the way that uh, climate change and the automobile industry are inter intimately related, uh, and energy policy, tax policy, there are many in interlinkages here, which I think Congress needs to think about um, more clearly, and we need to know more about and participate uh, more actively on. These issues are essential. Uh, for instance, the global uh, impasse on global warming is ar arguably, I would say, the number one issue. It's not, it, it, when, when I think about the number one issues that face the United States, I think number one is global warming, number two is glo global warming, number three is global warming. And uh, war distracts us, I think, from, from thinking about some more long-term questions. So that's where I'll end. Thank you very much, Nita. Um, maybe we have uh, made all of us think that being president isn't going to be very much fun in the near future. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I hope that uh, we haven't uh, overwhelmed you with problems. Uh, one of the fun parts of alumni events for me is hearing your views and taking your questions. And usually BU alumni are great at firing off comments or questions. So please, who would like to start us off? Yes, the lady in the middle. Wait for the microphone. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I should tell you to wait for a microphone. There's one coming to you. Would you uh, please address the situation of polarization, uh, not only in the Congress, but in the people um, throughout the United States and the world? Um, it seems to be quite divided. Um, Doug, would you like to start and then need to follow on the international? Sure. So uh, by any metric, you're exactly right. Congress is a much more polarized place than it ever has been uh, in the recent past. In fact, uh, if you look historically, Congress today looks very much like Congress did in the late 1890s and the early 19 teens. Uh, so we enter into periods in which we've got really divisive politics stark interbranch battles in periods of divided government uh, and relatively strong party leaders. So uh, what does this mean? I, I think it means obviously a divided government brings uh, the prospects for significant gridlock in terms of the ability to get things done in Washington, uh, as does unified government, uh, as long as you have uh, enough minority members to filibuster in the Senate, uh, it's a real uh, constraint on the ability of the administration uh, of either party to get done what, what it is that they want to do. So on some issues uh, where uh, certainly uh, tax and spending policy, there are ways of getting around the filibuster. Uh, if you're Harry Reid, you eventually 
play with the rules to get health healthcare through without uh, avoiding the filibuster, but you're limited in your ability to do that. Um, that said, uh, you know, um, I think actually sort of uh, Nancy Pelosi, when she was speaker, sort of would complain that, you know, the House would pass all of these wonderful things, including stuff to deal with global warming, uh, cap and trade, uh, and it would die in the Senate. And I think that regardless of who our president is, uh, that it's not going to fix that sort of incurable institutional problem uh, that we have. Now, whether or not it's polarization in the American people that are driving it uh, is, is a very interesting question. I think really, um, when you look at the vast majority of Americans, we do seem to be in the center. Uh, you know, we lean towards a party, we're partisan, uh, but at least in terms of our policy preferences, I think speaking to sort of what Professor Wilson said, we're somewhat moderate. You know, we may have views sometimes that sort of look le pretty far left or right, but on a lot of issues, uh, we do line up somewhere in the middle. That said, 50% of us don't vote. Uh, the vast majority of us don't donate to campaigns. Uh, the vast majority of us don't participate in the system by which we choose who our presidential nominees are going to be. And those that do uh, tend to have views that line up more along the extreme. They structure choices for us uh, that reflect candidates who tend to be more towards the, the left and the right of the ideological spectrum uh, than they do towards the, those of us in the missing middle. Nita, would you like to say something? Sure. Very quickly. It I want to point to the way that politics in the world works these days is much more grassroots and uh, uh, I think then looking at the opinions of people in the grassroots, you see that the United States has gone up in estimation of many people in the world except for a few places. And those are Pakistan and Yemen. Arguably, uh, Pakistan is the much more dangerous place. The United States is extremely unpopular there. But uh, in general, people are feeling better about American policies and uh, the, this particular government. We'll see if that lasts. Now, um, the other point I want to make is that it, let's think about the, the question of polarization at home, too, in this light. Arguably, there was a really exciting period of democratic renewal last year and moving into the early part of this year with Occupy movements and, but, and also movements in, in local elections and local politics that were new. Now what this means is, is that perhaps there is space for a, a little shakeup of this polarization. If we're not all focused on red and blue in Washington maybe, and we think about local politics, there is the potential for more conversation. And so, as Ed Markey said, Cong Congress is a stimulus response institution. So if we can sort of shake things up in our backyard, then uh, there'll be less, I think, polarization in the halls of Congress. It, it won't play so well. Thank you. Um, uh, the gentleman at the back. Uh, yeah. Good morning. I'd like someone to comment about, as far as the affordable a health care act. Um, you know, I know that on the right they always talk about, you know, the uh, mind-blowing budget deficits that it would supposedly cause, but I'd like someone to address the, the proposed savings as far as my understanding is when all the people who are going to have their health care needs who aren't covered are going to hospitals often as their first intervention and all that money is, I understand that money is, a lot of that money comes out of the state budget. I mean, where, where is that money? There's obviously some savings. So are state budgets better off if Obamacare is then put out there? Yeah, do you understand what I'm saying? Katie, would you like to? Um, so I think the question of budget savings with um, the Affordable Health Care Act is one that's really controversial um, right now, obviously both bipartisanship, but also within the research community. And so in particular, one part that I don't think there's a lot of agreement on in the medical community or in the public health community is whether it will be cost savings to have more people going to the um, to primary care as opposed to emergency rooms. And it's really unclear, there have been a lot of studies now in Massachusetts, whether having um, sort of public health care has saved a sufficient amount of money. And so 
there's some evidence, yes, people go to preventative care more, they don't go to the emergency room, and that's really good, and there's a lot of cost savings. And there's some evidence that even when they're able to go to the uh, their primary care doctors, they don't, they still go to the emergency room, they still cost a lot of money. And so um, there's no real agreement, which is, of course, not a very satisfying answer to you. Um, the second point that you brought up was about um, state budgets. And again, that's a really complex question because a lot of states right now, um, one of the big components of the Affordable Health Care Act requires Medicaid participation. Medicaid is a state program. And a lot of the right-wing states, um, so a lot of places in the South that have Republican governors, are refusing to implement key aspects of the Affordable Health Care Act. And so it'll be really interesting to see whether a lot of the states that are facing the most severe budget shortfall, some of these poor states in the South, that are also refusing to implement these um, plans, how much is the Obama administration or the next administration going to enforce those provisions with state governments? And will the states that most need the budget savings actually um, implement the aspects of the Affordable Health Care Act that are designed to create savings? I just want to throw in a very quick comment, which is that this whole healthcare area seems to me to typify the difficulty we have in having an honest conversation about policy choices. Uh, it's been a matter of tremendous partisan battle. Uh, the fact that I mentioned in my, my initial remarks that uh, one of the big budget problem areas is the rapid increase in Medicare and Medicaid expenses for the federal government, I don't think is going to be uh, changed very much by the Affordable Care Act. And yet, we don't really have a discussion about how well this is working. I don't know if any, do any of you read the New York Times? Um, there was to what to me was a shocking article yesterday about changes in life expectancy, where there's actually been a decline in life expectancy for people uh, without college degrees, or without high school diplomas, I'm sorry, I think it was. And uh, another figure that just sort of leapt out at me was that we've seen a decline from the United States being roughly ninth to 41st in female life expectancy. And you know, given the amount, uh, given the fact that we spend so much more than almost any other country as a proportion of our GDP, to me as a, a sort of, as an academic commentator, I think, let's have a discussion. What's going on here? You know, this thing can't be right if we're way up there in terms of expenditure and yet we're looking really mediocre in terms of, of outcomes. But I don't see anything in the current campaign that's helping us have that honest discussion. A gentleman over here had a question, I think. Good morning. Uh, my question goes uh, is related to global warming, and uh, I've heard that China is reluctant to pay fees, uh, claiming that um, if the U.S. didn't pay its own fees uh, back in the 50s, uh, when you know the American industry was booming, so why China should be paying fees now? Uh, and then, how you see that relation uh, between the U.S.-China relationship? Uh, in terms of uh, China being reluctant to pay for cleaner air and the U.S. borrowing money from China to fund the government. So I, th I think, um, if, I, if I may, I think there may be two issues here. One is the question of tackling global warming, and possibly the other question is the WTO uh, complaints uh, filed by, recently by the uh, administration and also possible countercharges by China in relation to the auto bailout. Nita, would you like to comment on either? I think of the... There being two fundamental issues here. One is justice. Clearly, uh, the justice of the burden of modifying the state's behavior with the prospect of global warming is unresolved. Who should bear the burden? Uh, prospectively, it, it, uh, we're all going to bear a burden uh, in terms of consequences. So it's, it's kind of like uh, you've got... 15 kids who played with the toys. Some of them had longer access to the toys, got better toys, but the toys are still out there needing to be cleaned up, and we all have to clean up, or else somebody's gonna be left holding the bag, and it's people living on the coasts, mostly at first, but we're all gonna be left holding the bag in terms of scarcities of food. So, uh, to be specific about China uh, and the US, the US is still about 25% of the greenhouse gas emissions. The U.S. can act alone and have an enormous uh, impact and has acted with the new uh, automobile standards. 
uh, have an enormous impact on the amount of greenhouse gases, just the CO. Methane's another matter, right? Methane, we need to deal with methane much more urgently, I think, than is on the table. But just in terms of CO, carbon dioxide. Um, so I would say uh, the U.S. should not wait to convince the Chinese to forego future growth. On the other hand, if, and they, they, we need to talk about the justice issues and fairness and equity, but the U.S. should not wait. Okay, that's like you know, waiting for the kids to clean up the toys. But we all have to start with the toys that we were using and are still using. Um, that, that would be the first answer. And then, um, then secondly, I think we've got to talk about these other gases that I mentioned. Clearly, we've got to talk about methane production, which is mostly agricultural. It's also um, inefficiencies in gas production. The U.S. has increased its natural gas production. Well, that increases methane. Let's, let's think about that. But uh, the agriculture is simply, the, the biggest agricultural producer of methane are cows. Okay, well, we have a lot of cows. Everybody has a lot of cows. Let's talk about that. So I, I, I'm saying, yes, there's a problem. There's a justice problem with China. But we, we can't wait to resolve this. We have to resolve it simultaneously with acting on the two big greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you. The gentleman over here. Thank you. To, can, you can you hear me? Yes, yes I do. Thank you. Uh, it's a great discussion. More questions than there are answers. I'd like to just ask a question related uh, to the deficit issue, um, the 37 cents on a dollar and the uh, paying off the national debt and the reductions and fighting over various expenditures because it seems to me that we're picking a very bad time to try to do that. And if we look at the bigger picture, the question is, what is the economic growth going to be for this country? It's historically three to five percent. Right now, it's one to two percent. If the if if you're the president and you see that the, the likelihood of the economy in the long term is going back to three to five percent, and that's an if, then it changes the entire picture of tax revenues. It, it changes everything. And the question I'm asking, are we putting ourselves in a box by trying to just deal with these issues during a recession and we're all fighting over a piece of the pie that may grow and basically solve the problem? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I think it's a great comment and I certainly would not favor any policy right now that is deflationary. I think it's an extremely complicated uh, combination that we're looking for, which I, I would suggest would be short-term stimulus and medium and long-term um, resolution of what I see as, as a budget problem. Um, I uh, think that that would be very tricky to pull off for, for, for any political system. You're quite right that economic growth will shrink that 37 cent uh, figure, or the 37 percent figure, if you like to put it that way. Uh, but on the other hand, I think nearly all the economic, all the budget projections suggest that even if we got economic growth back to a reasonable level, we would still have a significant budget problem. And uh, as I said, uh, you know, who knows? Uh, where else in the, people, in the world are people going to put their money? Maybe we can continue to, to borrow and borrow externally indefinitely, but maybe that is offering a hostage to fortune. Do you want to comment, Doug, at all? Sure. Um, yeah, I think I, I, I sort of re echo what, what you said before, Graham, about um, you know, entitlement spending and the rest. Oftentimes, there sort of seems to be this illusion that somehow there's a way to get out of the budget crisis by cutting domestic discretionary spending. And anyone that believes that is living in a dream world. Uh, you know, go look at a pie chart of the federal budget and you, know, you will see uh, that that simply cannot be done. Uh, so absolutely, you know, the, uh, doing things that would, that would curb growth in the short term, uh, if you'd like to see uh, the effects of that on an economy, uh, ask the Chancellor of the Exchequer in London and he can give you a pretty good report uh, about what that actually does do. You know, at the same time, I'm reminded a little bit 
uh, of the early 1990s. Uh, so we didn't have a, re a recession anywhere near as, as sharp or anywhere near as prolonged uh, as what we've been living through. You know, but during the first two years, the m more maligned years of the Clinton administration, you know, they did pass a little thing called the Budget Reconciliation or the Deficit Reduction Act and the Reconciliation Act. Um, you know, they started. Uh, you know, a little bit of putting us onto a path towards fiscal responsibility uh, that coupled with growth when it came uh, in the mid-1990s, you know, led us to an era of balanced budgets when the Fed Chair Alan Greenspan told us in 2000 the greatest threat to the American economy is that we would pay off the national debt too quickly. Uh, so, you know, um, it, it's, they're not parallel analogous situations, you know, but there does seem to be room uh, for uh, politicians with real political will uh, and courage to make some decisions that in the medium to long term would fix it. But unlike in the early 90s, entitlement reform would have to be at the, at the front of the list. Lady here. Thank you. I had actually two questions I wanted the group to comment on. The first one was the importance of the swing states in this particular election and what that means. Um, and the second one, nobody's really mentioned what's going on between Israel and Iran and how that could be a huge game changer for all of us uh, if things don't go the way we want them to go, which is for them to remain in their own borders with nothing happening. Um, but I do think that there's going to be a confrontation that's going to be forced, and it's worried me. And I don't know how or if the U.S. is going to be drug into that one. Thank you. Well, two great questions, and the first, I think, has got Doug written on it, and the second, Nita. Sure. So swing states, obviously, right? This, this is the legacy of the Electoral College, the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, most of us simply aren't targeted by campaigns. They don't care about us because we're either solidly blue or solidly red. Uh, sometimes it's fun to explain to freshmen that the reason that you're getting ads is not because you live in Boston, it's because you're close enough to the New Hampshire media market, right? You know, four electoral votes that are potentially important uh, as we saw in 2000, right? All the emphasis on 538 odd votes in Florida, but if Al Gore had carried New Hampshire, he would have been the president of the United States. Uh, so when you look at swing states, obviously that's where all the energy is, that's where most of the money is. If you've got tremendous financial advantages, uh, such as President Obama did in 2008, you can spend some money and force your opponent to defend home turf, and maybe Governor Romney will be able to do that this time around. Uh, but, you know, very insight, uh, insightful. And so maybe we shouldn't be looking quite so much at the macro economy, uh, really. What really matters is how are things in Michigan? How are things in Ohio? Um, what might we do for people uh, on Medicaid in Florida, Medicare, uh, et cetera? What do things look like in Virginia, which is, you know, weathered the recession considerably better than other places? That that regional, local component might be much more important than the national picture that we see given their prominent importance electorally. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Israel and Iran are a real mess to be use a technical term we often use in international relations theory. And what that really means is that they're on an escalatory spiral. Uh, the great thing about the last few months is that both sides, I hope, they seem to be trying to ratchet down the tension. Okay, and there's hope in the long run about this for two reasons. One, uh, the sanctions are biting very hard for Iran. And that increases the pressure for them to make some tough choices. And it, it tends to fracture the elites in when sanctions bite. So there may be a change in the policy of Iran coming. Um, the second uh, bit of hope here is that I think people realize um, the rationality here uh, being pretty important, that the consequences of a strike cannot be contained. And uh, they've scared themselves pretty well. Here we are in the anniversary year of the 50th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis, or is it 60th? 50th. And I should know, because I was born the years just prior to that. Um, we're reminded of the potential catastrophe that will come. The Israelis, 100 or 200, we don't know how many nuclear weapons, um, are a sufficient deterrent to Iran should they get five nuclear weapons. 
there are sufficient deterrent. If the Iranians um, get 10, probably a sufficient deterrent. In other words, Israel can deter Iran. No sane, and I think they're pretty sane there, Iranian will do this. Uh, so I, th I think the thing to do is calm the, the Israelis down a bit and not feed into this sort of mano a mano uh, kind of confrontation. So that, that's the U.S. role as well as maintaining the sanctions, which will, I think, in the long run lead to uh, domestic change in Iran along with the other pressures on the Iranian government to, to modify their positions or to have a change, in fact, in the composition of the Iranian government. Um, I uh, try not to push, uh, I'm, I think I succeed, I'm careful not to push my personal political views in my classes, uh, but there is one exception, which is that I tell my students that one of the great changes that we could make in the Constitution is to get rid of the Electoral College. And I say that not only because the Electoral College always has the potential of generating a 2,000 result where the person who wins the Electoral College actually loses the popular vote by, in that case, half a million votes, uh, but also because, going back to some of the questions about polarization, uh, wouldn't it actually be good for our politics if the Democratic candidate had to win as many votes as possible in Texas and Georgia, and if the Republican candidate had to campaign in San Francisco and try and get as many votes as possible in San Francisco? So I've just done it again. I've preached at you just to like preach at my students, but the gentleman with the uh, wonderful BU regalia on. Uh, thank you. Uh, there's a question for uh, Professor Einstein. Uh, you mentioned three issues, and I really see a fourth issue that uh, I, I see inextricably linked to youth unemployment and the problem of budgets in the states, and that is the forced premature retirement of uh, boomers during the last recession. Uh, the <clears throat> problem I see is that fre frequently we're hearing that this, um, one of the major solutions for Social Security is that folks uh, will just be working longer. Well, for uh, many people in their... Uh, over mid-50s, that option's already been taken off the table. So that combined with the youth unemployment that you talked about, I mean, we're seeing a massive waste of human capital. And this impacts the states because you have this loss of revenue from, uh, you know, two, two cohorts of the population that are uh, unemployed or underemployed, and they're increasingly requiring, uh, you know, many services. So. I wonder if you have a comment on that. No, absolutely. And I think you're pointing out um, what I was saying in terms of the massive, um, the, the downsides of the massive budget cuts that states have had to do. They've laid off a lot of their most expensive employees or encouraged them to take early retirement packages. And many of the most expensive employees, because of the length of service, tend to be people in their 50s and 60s. And so you're absolutely right that there is this real trade off between saving money in salaries and future pension costs, but then also losing potentially very productive employees who are contributing to the workforce. Um, and I think long run, you're absolutely right that that can just be a further, um, further crisis for these states um, in terms of future productivity. Hey, lady could, in the... Can I, can oh, I step sorry. in? Uh, uh, sure. Um, this relates a little bit to the question of the gentleman behind you as well. And, and I wanted to say that think about the productivity of military spending versus productivity of sp spending money on something else. So for every million dollars one spends on, uh, let's say, building a tank or an aircraft carrier, maintain, maintenance, uh, in other words, military spending more on average produces about eight jobs per million dollars. You spend it on construction, it's about 16 jobs. Or in education, I think it's 12 jobs per million dollars. In other words, there are more productive ways to spend the money if one were to cut the military budget. If you just reduce the military budget to what it was in 2003, you'd have 300 billion more dollars to do something else with without changing taxes, or you could reduce taxes by 300 billion and let people do something with it. So. Uh, there, there are productivity consequences for military spending, which then lead to uh, consequences for taxes, revenue for the government, and ultimately for the states, which have suffered because federal revenue has declined to states. I'm sorry, the lady here. I'm fascinated by the discussion on political parties' platforms. 
Um, policy wonks love platforms. The run-of-the-mill person looking at a candidate uh, very rarely thinks of what the party's platform says, except in an area for which they have a bone to pick. Um, what do you envision, or do you see any um, move for either party's direction to uh, not necessarily spend an inordinate amount of time on platform discussions that simply polarize even within their own parties, uh, witness the Democrat uh, uh, Party's issue with Jerusalem and with God in, and um, our mayor, we're from California, our mayor, Villa Grossa, trying to figure out how to get the vote that he wanted. Thank you. Doug, would you like to? Sure. Uh, yeah, I think platforms are an anachronism of a pre-McGovern Frazier age. Uh, and to the extent that the only reason we even focus on the party conventions is surrounding the presidential nominations that are all, of course, sort of foregone conclusions, and presidents have so successfully dissociated themselves from party platforms and the rest, um, you know, one could argue that perhaps they are polarizing figures. Uh, they're nice things for the media to talk about for a few days, and then I think for the most part they slide into obscurity. So will this sort of vestigial organ of American party politics someday wither away? Perhaps. Uh, I think it makes a number of ideologues in both parties feel good about themselves. Uh, they produce the occasional embarrassment, which don't seem too damaging in the long run. Uh, so maybe, maybe not. But um, I'm a little skeptical that they have much long-term impact, even on the polarization, because they are just reflecting the views of some of those ideologues within the party that aren't going away, unfortunately. Uh, lady here. Thank you for this panel. Um, I'm an alum from BU Med in the 80s. My question is primarily to Professor Crawford, but um, it's, uh, everything is connected, including the 37% you know, I've watched with interest the um, development of the health grant strategy throughout uh, the last two decades, but particularly since 2004, when President Kent Clinton um, gave a few million to select African countries. Bush. No, um, early 2000 at the end. Sorry, yes, early 2000 at the end of the Clinton sure. administration, where he gave a few. Some, some millions to select African countries to get their infrastructure ready for um, HIV AIDS drugs. And then there was a tsunami of money from the Bush administration immediately following that, but it began with the Clinton administration. My question or my comment is, as we talk about the 37% and as we talk about the U.S. interest, um, narrow and broad broad aspects of it. I don't hear much about this um, in this election about uh, an end strategy for what has been nearly um, $40 billion given to uh, global HIV, AIDS, malaria, and TB. And I am from MED, so I, I'm not um, advocating that this be stopped, but where does that figure into the picture? Where does it figure into the election? And what are your thoughts on that? I don't think it figures into the election. Uh, I think that the U.S. commitment to uh, public health, uh, global public health, um, is uh, minimal, and uh, I don't see it playing very much. Now, the, the money on HIV AIDS and tuberculosis came with strings, and I think there was a reaction to the strings. And so some of that, uh, it's, it's actually had, I think, a sort of uh, uh, negative impact on the American image in Africa among those who watch it. Uh, there's also, I think, so little of the U.S. total budget that goes to foreign assistance. It's less than 1%. I think it's about 0.1%. That it's, it's not usually consequential in terms of the entire budget. Uh, there's an argument for increasing, I would say, that uh, uh, 
investment, if you will, in global public health. Maybe Jim Kim will make it uh, from the, uh, his new position as head of the World Bank, uh, physician who works on um, multi-drug resistant TB and HIV. Um, but I, I, I don't really see it as, as having much play. I think it, it, it should have more, and there should be more investment. Um, I'd, I'd like to see that. Uh, I don't see a bold move in that direction. I, I was very surprised by um, President Bush's move in uh, the middle of his then uh, eight-year tenure, and it largely came from one ambassador, one person, uh, Jendai Fraser, the U.S. ambassador to South Africa, who was in fact on Bush's National Security Council. So, uh, before that, so it may be that some some uh, somebody gets the ear of the next president and says, "Let's look at multi-drug resistant TB as a huge uh, problem," and the same with the HIV/AIDS. Thank you. There was a lady behind. Um, I wanted to ask a question about uh, the Supreme Court. Because um, I think the next president will probably pick at least one person there, and um, we've seen the Supreme Court deal with um, the Health Care Act and on uh, immigration. I wanted to see what impact the next president would have on the Supreme Court makeup, and what issues that might come up uh, before them, um, and how that'll make a difference on future policy. Terrific question. Thank you, Doug. Uh, it's so hard to forecast because you know who are who are the retirees? I guess Ginsburg is is likely, um, yeah, Thomas is getting up there. So I mean, it, it's, it's so hard to forecast just in terms of it all matters who that pivotal person is in, in those ways. Um, and I think we, we saw this to some extent um, during uh, the Bush administration where when Roberts came up, you know, it was replacing Rehnquist. You go conservative for conservative. Some people raised a little bit of a stink, but that wasn't the real, the real clincher, right? But you know, sort of when you get, um, uh, the next retirement and that's sort of the swing vote, then you have the real battle over, over Scalia and the rest. Uh, Scalia, excuse me, um, Alito. Uh, I almost said Scalita, which was sort of would uh, be the, the problem, uh, as they are tough to, to tell the differences. But clearly, uh, the, the types of issues, you know, We've seen uh, Medicaid uh, is brought up, and you know, so the questions about the state uh, budgets, and that's the only part of the health care ruling that really goes against the Obama administration is giving states that opt out, which provides the budgetary flexibility, but undermines a key part of the way in which the law works, because health care will be a continued battle regardless of who is president in terms of how this law is actually going to be implemented. I'm sure Katie can talk about uh, that in greater detail. I wouldn't be surprised to see another legal challenge uh, in that realm uh, or in many of the other policy areas that could be dealt with. The courts have seemed to have become a bit more aggressive uh, in challenging federal statutes, or at least hearing challenges to federal statutes, and construing Commerce Clause and, and other um, governmental powers in a more narrow way, which really opens the door for more uh, influence of the court uh, on policy. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in and say that, uh, you know, I think when conservatives were dismayed by Justice Roberts um, creating a majority to uphold the bulk of the Affordable Care Act, what they missed in their disappointment was that we've entered uh, a really quite uncharted territory in terms of the Commerce Clause that really for a long period from uh, really the late 1930s until uh, quite recently, uh, the attitude of the Supreme Court to the Commerce Clause has been that Congress can do almost anything it likes under the Commerce Clause affecting economic and social policy questions. Uh, and uh, the majority on the Supreme Court that said you can't justify the Affordable Care Act under the Commerce Clause, I think opened up sort of really quite uncharted territory in terms of what future decisions might look like in limiting the freedom of action of President and Congress and domestic policy. I, I would actually say the same about the um, uh, part of the law that was struck down on, on the, if you like, the federalism question. And so I think that not only could there be a swing vote, but we're at a really critical moment in terms of whether the majority decision in striking, saying you couldn't have the Affordable Care Act under the, um, under the Commerce Clause is part of a gathering momentum in the courts to limit the domestic role of government, or whether it's just a, a, a flashing uh, uh, meteor in the sky. Katie, would you like to comment? I mean, I think 
in addition to sort of these issues that you're talking about, the Supreme Court is going to be ruling on um, voter ID laws and I think have a profound effect not only on these sort of important institutional um, configurations that we're talking about, but also potentially on how we regulate elections and potentially altering the way that we enforce the Voting Rights Act. Um, so the implications for sort of who is put on the next court, it's not just about, you know, the Affordable Care Health, yeah, Affordable Health Care Act, it's about who could be president for you know, decades to come, so. And with the Voting Rights Act being raised, I mean, that gets back to the federalism question, you know, uh, the Tenth Amendment lives again, I guess, in the, in the contemporary Supreme Court, and who knows uh, exactly whether, how the issue of federal supremacy over, over states in terms of deciding those questions will be decided. I think we've got time for about one more question. Yes, uh, gentleman at the side. Thank you. I'd like to return to Professor Crawford's comments about Iran and would love to hear more details about the extent to which the sanctions are biting. We often hear that sanctions don't work. There's ways around them, so they're in casual conversations held to be ineffective. And I think if I heard you right, you said that uh, cooler heads are prevailing, but we've just had an interesting visit from Mr. Netanyahu, and so it from that point of view, it's not as clear that cooler heads are prevailing. I wouldn't say Bibi Netanyahu is a cool head, um, but he's not the only player. But let's just think about, uh, I'll uh, focus on sanctions for one moment. Most of the theorizing about and the sort of common sense wisdom about sanctions is they only work if two conditions prevail. One is they're leak proof. Nothing gets through or nothing gets out if you're engaged in an embargo of buying somebody's stuff. And the other thing is, the other prevailing uh, wisdom is that they work by changing people's minds. Neither is true. Okay, sanctions can bite, that is, diminish someone's capacity to act and not change their mind at all, even if they are leaky. And the, the best example of this is the sanctions against South Africa, the oil embargo and the arms embargo. South Africa, for example, bought lots of weapons on the international market. They got lots of oil through uh, covert means. But the effect of the sanctions was to jack up the price of everything they did, 100%, 200%, 300%. And then make having their policies very costly, which tended to fracture the elites. They said, we can't keep spending this much money on that. Uh, the same thing can happen in another authoritarian setting like Iran, when it's very important that you maintain your internal coalition. The sanctions work by decreasing the revenue to Iran and increasing the cost of everything they do. No Iranian leader need change their mind, in other words, for the sanctions to affect their capacity to act. And the, there's the other parts of U.S. policy which are biting, for instance, Stuxnet, the, 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 uh, the program to attack the capacity of the Iranians' uh, centrifuge, that is the, the uh, computer assault, the computer virus assault. And there are other covert things going on that the Israelis are doing which are having an effect. But I think in the long run, the sheer cost of making nuclear weapons are, are uh, daunting for any government. And this government is facing decreasing revenue and other pressures. So I think, yes, the sanctions are working. The administration privately says the sanctions are working. And the uh, uh, Europeans are saying the sanctions are working. They are working. It's just slow motion. But we, in fact, want things to go very slow in this region for there to be time for other things to happen. Well, let's squeeze in one last quick question. OK. We like easy questions. What are your predictions for the election? Who wins in 2000? <laughs> the question for those who didn't hear it was, who's going to win the elections? What are your opinions on who's going to win the elections? Okay, Doug, do you, do you just want to mention very quickly the forecast models or not? Uh, uh, well, I mean, we could talk about forecast models, but if you just wanted a quick prediction at the time, um, Obama, 305 roughly electoral votes. Well, there's a brave man for you. Uh, <laughs> Can I say something about that? Um, I think really interesting is the Senate race, uh, the, cha the composition of the Senate, a little bit the House, but I'm very I interested to see how uh, the foot and mouth syndrome has struck and uh, maybe uh, 
things will shake up even more. That's exciting. I agree with Doug, it's likely Obama because of uh, sort of long-term trends in, and uh, then the short-term uh, foot-and-mouth problem that the nominee and the Republican Party said. Okay, seeing as you're being all so brave, uh, I should give Katie a chance. <laughs> I mean, I largely agree with what um, you know, everyone else in this panel is saying, is that it's likely to be Obama, both because of long-term economic trends, particularly in swing states. A lot of the swing states are doing surprisingly well. Um, Ohio, for example, as a consequence of um, Obama's bailout of the car industry, is actually doing pretty well. Virginia is doing better than the country as a whole, and so I suspect that Obama will win because of those trends, but I think what will be interesting to see is what's happening in the Senate, um, where again, the Democrats are doing surprisingly well in a number of races in swing states like Wisconsin. So yeah, I think that that's sort of where more of the uncertainty in my mind lies. One last uh, quick thing. So Graham, you said about uh, the Electoral College. One other sort of quirk of our constitutional system that I think really messes things up in terms of, of cycles is the staggered senatorial elections. So this is an awful year for Democrats, although they seem like they are going to potentially eke out maintaining control. If Obama wins, midterms are generally bad, and 2014 looks horrific for Democrats with all of the seats they're defending. And then, once that happens, you move around to 2016, and 2016 looks like, regardless, it's gonna be a really bad year, tough year for Republicans. So just given the fact that you've got these staggered elections with different races coming in, um, it's always interesting, and the Senate can be this sort of counter-cyclical, almost, institution. Did you want to see? <laughs> I don't know if you all heard, the comment was that a political gap is when a politician tells the truth. I hate to be the, the spoiler of fun, but I have been told that we've got to uh, wrap it up. At, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, On uh, that note, I think it's probably a good, a good uh, concluding point. Um, uh, this discussion, by the way, of our election year conversations will continue um, with expert alumni from the College of Communications this afternoon, uh, and they will discuss the role of media in this campaign. So if you're interested in that subject, please do come back. On behalf of the Alumni Association and the Alumni Council, we'd like to thank you for joining us this morning. We hope that you enjoy the rest of the day, and especially the celebration of BU at the Aganis um, Arena this evening. Uh, if you have any questions about that event, this event, anything else going on this weekend, please don't hesitate. Call on the council staff. You'll see us around campus. Uh, anyone here will be glad to help you. And most importantly, I want to thank Professor Wilson and the political science faculty for a really terrific discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.